Thank you for joining us today. My name is Tom Moser and I'm glad you're here. We are in our eighth week of a 12-week study of Romans. The purpose of our study is not just to learn for the sake of knowledge. The purpose is for us to be transformed by the renewing of our minds, as Paul says in Romans 12, with the ultimate purpose to proclaim Jesus the Messiah. This week we're looking at Romans chapter 9. It's been said that Israel is the only nation in the world with a complete history, a past, a present, and a future. In Romans 9, Paul defends the character of God by showing that Israel's past history actually magnifies the attributes of God. We'll be looking at God's faithfulness, God's righteousness, God's justice, and God's grace. Back in chapter 3, I played the part of a uh, rabbi. There we go. And I said, what? what? Um, I have a friend in the wardrobe department. It could be Celtic. Yeah. Anyway, I said, if being God's covenant people is not enough, if being custodian of the law is not enough, if being circumcised is not enough, if being chosen to bring light to the Gentiles is not enough, if being custodian of God's redemptive plan is not enough, what value is there in being a Jew? Well, we're going to re-examine that issue again here in chapter 9. I speak the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience confirms it through the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my people, those of my own race, the people of Israel. Paul is willing to be cursed for the sake of his people. This is the Paul who just said in the prior verse, for I'm convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now he does a dramatic reversal when it looks when he looks to his own people, Israel. Of course, this is an attempt at a plea bargain that will fail because it's contrary to God's righteous nature. This deep sorrow reminds us of Moses back in Exodus making a similar plea to God for his people. The next day, Moses said to the people, you've committed a great sin. So Moses went back to the Lord and said, oh, what a great sin these people have committed. They have made themselves gods of gold. But now, please forgive their sin. But if not, then blot me out of the book you have written. It didn't happen then, and Paul knows it won't happen to him. As has been said, one cannot measure the speech of the heart with the rules of logic. You may have noticed in the prior slide that uh, we only read part of verse 4. We'll finish that up here. Theirs is the adoption of sonship. Theirs the divine glory, the covenants, the receiving of the law, the temple worship, and the promise. And of course, what Paul is talking about here is the nation of Israel. I want to pay particular attention, though, to verse 5. Theirs are the patriarchs, and from them is traced the human ancestry of the Messiah, who is God over all, forever praised. Amen. That verse is particularly important to me as a adult convert to Christ who grew up hearing that the Bible never really says that Jesus is God. That was made up by the church or by his disciples. Well, the Bible does say that very plainly, and here it is. What's interesting is how other this is the NIV, how other versions have uh, written verse 5. In the English Standard Version, 
says that is the Christ who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. I like that. The King James, hmm, Christ came who is over all, comma, God blessed forever. In the Revised Standard Version, is the Christ, God, period, God who is over all, be blessed forever. Amen. And then in the New Revised Standard Version, comes the Messiah who is over all, comma, God blessed forever period. Amen. As you can see, it does make a difference, and I believe that the English Standard Version and the New International Version have it, have it written correctly, and this is what Paul clearly intended. The Christ, who is God over all, forever praised. Amen. It is not as though God's word had failed, for not all who are descended from Israel are Israel. Nor because they are his descendants are they all Abraham's children. On the contrary, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. It's the first part of verse 6, which is the important part that Paul is trying to say here. It is not as though God's word had failed. His point is that God is faithful to his word and to Israel. The second point is that by God's sovereign choice, he told Abraham that Abraham's second son, Isaac, will be the future of the chosen people, not Ishmael. The quote in verse 7 is from Genesis 21. But God said to him, Do not be so distressed about the boy and your slave woman. Listen to whatever Sarah tells you, because it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. And Paul is not finished with this line of reasoning. In other words, it is not the children by physical descent who are God's children, but it is the children of the promise who are regarded as Abraham's offspring. For this was how the promise was stated. At the appointed time, I will return and Sarah will have a son. Paul is tracing the history of God's selection of Abraham's descendants who will be the covenant people. What he's saying is that as God chose Isaac rather than Ishmael, so also does he now choose to bless those who by placing their faith in Christ become the true children of Abraham. It is spiritual kinship, Paul is saying, not ethnic origin that term determines who will be a true Israelite. At this point, a Jewish antagonist might have questioned Paul's argument on the basis that Ishmael, as compared to Isaac, was not a true son of Abraham. His mother was Hagar, a maidservant of Sarah. So Paul strengthens his case by bringing into the account of two sons of Rebekah. Not only that, but Rebekah's children were conceived at the same time by our father Isaac. Yet before the twins were born, or had done anything good or bad, in order that God's purpose and election might stand, not by works, but by him who calls, she was told the older will serve the younger. So Paul is giving an answer to the Jewish antagonists. Oh, but then along comes verse 13. Just as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. We need to talk about this. This statement in verse 13 is taken from Malachi, the last book in the Old Testament. I have loved you, says the Lord, but you ask, how have you loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? Yet I have loved Jacob, but Esau I have hated, and I have turned his hill country into a wasteland and left his inheritance to the desert jackals. Why would God hate a person, and especially a son of Isaac? Malachi is most likely written a thousand years after the twins, Esau and Jacob, were born. 
doesn't seem reasonable that God is carrying a grudge for a man who has been dead for centuries. There is more evidence in the Old Testament we need to briefly review to understand this statement. From Genesis 36. This is the account of the family line of Esau, that is, Edom. Esau took his wives from the women of Canaan. This passage tells us much about Esau and provides a clue about his descendants. First, we see that Esau marries into the pagan culture in the surrounding Palestine, which tells us how different he was than his brother Jacob. It also tells us about his descendants who are the nation of Edom. The Edomites became the enemy of Israel, despite the fact that they are related. On this map, you can see the geographical relationship between these nations. Edom is the area south of the Dead Sea. Esau continues to marry more women from the pagan surrounding culture. When Esau was 40 years old, he marries Judith, daughter of Beri, the Hittite, and also Basemeth, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite. They were a source of grief to Isaac and Rebekah. The relationship between Esau and his parents deteriorated, as did the relationship between God and the Edomites. So in my view, the statement that God hates Esau is about the corrupt pagan culture of the Edomites as opposed to the descendants of Jacob. By the way, a more challenging question is why did God continue to love Jacob? Again, Paul is expecting an objection from antagonistic Jews who will ask Paul if he's arguing that God is unrighteous or unjust. What then shall we say? Is God unjust? Not at all. Paul's answer is not at all, but I like it best in the King James Version. God forbid. Exclusion of some descendants of Abraham did not constitute a failure on God's part to maintain his covenant relationship with Israel. Paul goes on in verse 15. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I'll have compassion on whom I have compassion. This quote is from Exodus. And the Lord said, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. God is speaking to Moses after the people built a golden calf to worship while Moses was on Mount Sinai. God's sovereign election not to destroy a stiff-necked and unfaithful people was because of his grace. It does not make God unrighteous. Paul's point is that God is sovereign and he makes election based on his perfect righteousness. It does not therefore depend on human desire or effort, but on God's mercy. For scripture says to Pharaoh, I raised you up for this very purpose, that I might display my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Therefore, God has mercy on whom he wants to have mercy, and he hardens whom he wants to harden. Paul now moves from using the nation of Israel as an illustration to a person, Pharaoh. The Old Testament scripture in verse 17 here is taken from Exodus, where God is telling Moses to warn Pharaoh of the punishment he will suffer for refusing to release the Jews from bondage. We know how that ends, and Paul says to the Romans here that God will harden who he wants to harden. It might be good to spend a few minutes here to talk about hardening. The struggle between Moses and Pharaoh starts with God telling Moses that he will harden Pharaoh's heart. From Exodus 7, but I will harden Pharaoh's heart and though I multiply my signs and wonders in Egypt, he will not listen to you. Then I will lay my hand on Egypt, and with mighty acts of judgment, I'll bring out my divisions, my people, the Israelites. Recall that the purpose of this conflict between the Gentile ruler, Pharaoh, 
and the Jewish slave, Moses, was what we just read in verse 17, to display God's power and proclaim his name in all the earth. And sure enough, here we are, thousands of years later, still talking about this event. To understand this verse, we need to look at what's going on in Pharaoh's heart in his own sinful self-will self -will and rebellion against God. Consider these verses. Yet Pharaoh's heart became hard, and he would not listen to them, just as the Lord had said. Then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is unyielding. He refuses to let the people go. But when Pharaoh saw that, there's, that there was relief, he hardened his heart and would not listen to Moses and Aaron, just as the Lord had said. This time also Pharaoh hardened his heart and would not let the people go. The magician said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. But Pharaoh's heart was hard and he would not listen, just as the Lord had said. Pharaoh investigated and found that not even one of the animals of the Israelites had died. Yet his heart was unyielding and he would not let the people go. This is God saying that I will see your five and raise you ten. Pharaoh's hardened his own heart, and God confirmed it. We know how this ends with Pharaoh changing his heart a final time and charging with his army across the desert after the Israelites to the edge of the Red Sea. The people are caught there in the, between the devil and the deep blue or Red Sea, and they cry out to Moses, and Moses pleads to God. And God says, I'll harden the hearts of the Egyptians so they will go in after them. And I'll gain glory through Pharaoh and all his army, through his chariots and his horsemen. So we know how this ends. The Red Sea is parted. The Israelites walk across on dry land. Pharaoh leads in the hundreds and hundreds of chariots and all of his army in after the Israelites and the sea closes over them and they're all drowned. This next section is about God's justice. Again, Paul is anticipating objections to his discussion about divine selection. This time it is, then why does God still blame us? If God makes the choices like he did with Pharaoh, how can he hold man responsible? One of you will say to me, then why does God still blame us? For who is able to resist his will? I love Paul's answers to this question. He answers with another question. In fact, he answers with a series of questions. Let's look at them. But who are you, a human being, to talk back to God? Who are you to talk back to God? Shall what is form? Say to the one who formed it, why did you make me like this? Or does not the potter have the right to make out of the same lump of clay, some pottery for special purposes and some for common use? These questions all get to the same point. Who are you to judge the creator? We don't choose our parents, our date of birth, our place of birth. God determines who will be a Moses or a Pharaoh. But Pharaoh had great opportunities to learn about the true God, yet he chose to rebel. Even when he saw the power of God, he chose pride and evil. And Paul isn't finished asking questions to make his point. Verses 22, 24. What if God, although choosing to show his wrath and make his power known, bore with great patience the objects of his wrath prepared for destruction? What if he did this to make the riches of his glory known to the objects of his mercy, whom he prepared in advance for glory, even us, whom he also called, not only from the Jews, but also from the Gentiles? The grammar in these first two verses is difficult to say the least. 
Part of the difficulty is that when we see an if clause, we expect a then clause to follow, such as, if I sin, then I can expect God's wrath. This is not how these verses are structured. Here, Paul asks two questions. What if in verse 22 and what if in verse 23? And the answers just are not real clear to us. But it helps if we see two objects and how they are different. In verse 22, the object receives wrath. In verse 23, uh, the object receives mercy. Both are prepared in advance, one for destruction and the other for glory. In the case of the one prepared for destruction, God did so with great patience so that, so that the sinner might repent. The patience shown to Pharaoh is an example. It took 10 plagues for Pharaoh to get the message. Finally, what is God's purpose in doing all this? The answer was, the answer was stated back in verse 17 when God said to Pharaoh, I will raise you up that I might display my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. The same pur purpose is stated here to make his power and the riches of his glory known to Jews and to Gentiles. Verses 25 and 26. As indeed he says in Hosea, those who were not my people, I will call my people, and her who was not beloved, I will call beloved. And in the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they will be called sons of the living God. This quote by Paul is a loose quote from Hosea chapter 2, verse 23, which says, And I will sow her for myself in the land. Now I'll have mercy on no mercy, and I will say to not my people, You are my people, and he shall say, You are my God. And also um, Hosea chapter 1, verse 10, which says, Yet the number of children of Israel should be like the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured in numbers. And in the place where it was said to them, You are not my people, it shall be said to them, Children of the living God. These quotes are all from the English Standard Version because of the more literal translation, which we'll talk more about in a minute. Notice how in verse 23 there is a mixed use of pronouns, her and he. And no mercy and not my people are capitalized. Paul's purpose in these two verses is to demonstrate to the Jews who are reading this letter that Gentiles are included in God's redemptive plan and only a remnant of the believing Jews will be saved. But there is more to the story when we turn to the book of Hosea. Hosea chapter 1, starting at verse 2, The Lord said to Hosea, Go take to yourself a wife of whoredom, and have children of whoredom, for the land commits great whoredom by forsaking the Lord. It's hard to imagine how, but Hosea does as God instructed, and marries Gomer, daughter of Diplium, and they have three children. God told Hosea what names to give each child, and what you see here are the Hebrew names, but the meaning of the names are important because they are the children of an unfaithful marriage. Jezreel is a famous place in Israel. There's a valley of Jezreel. A lot of things happen there later, and the meaning of that is God sows. The girl's name means not loved or no mercy. And the youngest son, his name means not my people. The names are a warning to the northern kingdom of Israel. So when we look again at Hosea 2, chapter, chapter 2, verse 23, we see how the words used in describing the unfaithful people, and Hosea is actually saying the names of his own children to those people.
Let's go back to Romans. And Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, Though the number of the sons of Israel be as the sands of the sea, only a remnant of them will be saved. For the Lord will carry out his sentence upon the earth fully and without delay. And as Isaiah predicted, If the Lord of hosts had not left us offspring, we would have been like Sodom and become like Gomorrah. God promised Abraham his descendants would be like the sands of the sea, too many to count. God kept that promise, but those who put their trust in their birthright and the law will not be saved. Isaiah told Israel that only a remnant would be saved. Chapter 11 that we're going to get to in a few weeks Paul says that the remnant is chosen by grace. Jesus said in response to the faith of the centurion, taken from Mark 8, I say to you that many will come from east and the west and will take their places at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And to emphasize his point, Paul reminds the Jews about Sodom and Gomorrah. Recall that only Lot and his two daughters survived the total destruction of those cities. This concluding section is about God's grace, both for the Jews and the Gentiles. What then shall we say? Here Paul asks the same question he asked in verse 14. Paul's answer here is a longer and more thoughtful reply. It's in two verses, but one long sentence. Let's break it into several clauses to make sure we get the full implication. I'm going to use bold type to point out the repeating word, which is righteousness. That the Gentiles, who did not pursue righteousness, have obtained it, a righteousness that is by faith, but the people of Israel, who pursued the law as the way of righteousness, have not attained their goal. In the concluding clause, the goal was the law and righteousness. Paul's point is that they failed at both because they failed at faith. The Jews rejected grace, righteousness, and tried to please God with law, righteousness instead of permitting their right religious privileges to lead them to Christ, they use those same privileges as a substitute for Christ. Why not? Paul's question is, why did the Gentiles obtain what they did not pursue, but the Jews did not? My classmates and I tired of the Socratic method with endless questions from law professors. Paul uses his time-honored method, but he does something that we appreciate. He provides answers because they pursued it not by faith, but as if it were by works. It's not birth or behavior that produces righteousness. It is faith. Then he closes with another Old Testament illustration that is easy for first century Jews to identify. They stumbled over the stumbling stone. As it is written, see I lay in Zion a stone that causes people to stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. And the one who believes in him will never be put to shame. The stumbling stone taken from Isaiah and Psalms. Let's take a closer look. Paul has gathered two passages from Isaiah and one from Psalms that are worth reviewing. Christ is a cornerstone rejected by the builders. He is a precious stone, a sure foundation, and it was placed in Zion, and it became a rock of stumbling because it was there by grace. They stumbled over the offer because it deprived them of any proprietary involvement in their own salvation, too proud to accept God's willingness to forgive sinners. They stumbled headlong into eternity, rejecting God's grace and sanctuary. We have nothing to fear from the stumbling stone because we have this good news from Paul that salvation is by grace, 
a gift that cannot be earned. Next week, Jim Donovan takes us through Chapter 10. I hope you can join us. Thank you.